All right, guys, I'm back for more. Um, this time I'm going, you can see it's much later, it's dark here in my house. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about two more things. One are the protists and the other are the fungi, but I'm gonna divide this into two so they're not so long. The last one was a little bit long. Um, so we are moving out of the prokaryotic domain and into domain eukaryota. We're going to talk a lot more about eukaryotes, but separately um, next week. But tonight I want to talk to you about protists first. So before we do, let's think back to what we talked about in the last lecture, which was um, bacteria, archaea, and... Um, viruses. So looking at this advertisement that I yanked out of somewhere, um, there it's not, it's false advertising. So if you look at it, look at what it says, it says fight back and arm yourself to beat the cold and flu virus. And then look at that picture and think for a minute what's wrong with that particular advertisement. So hopefully you are saying that's not a virus, silly. Those are bacteria floating around in there, and indeed those are cocci, and those are bacilli, which are not at all viruses. Viruses are way smaller and way more weird looking. So that's false advertisement. It says to fight back against the cold and flu virus, which is not the case at all. Those are bacteria. See, you learn so much just already. All right, so let's look at the the eukaryotic world. So eukaryotes, remember, these are not, they, well, that's not true. They can be single-celled or they can be multi-celled. They have a nucleus, right? That's one of the main things. They have cell organelles and they have a nucleus. So that's the big difference between um, what we talked about last time and what we're going to talk about today. So to start with the protists. So the protists, um, here's our little timeline on the bottom of from the beginning of time, 4.5 billion years ago, to now, well, not now, but to where the humans showed up 6 million years ago, we are going to try to figure out where do these guys get in here, right? Where do these protists show up? So we're kind of thinking like in this area, right in this sort of spot. Um, so remember, this is a... a kind of a cladogram showing us over here our bacteria, our archaea, which we already talked about today. The protists and the fungi are on the menu. Next Coming next week will be the plants and the animals. So we have a shared common ancestor with the um, right, right here, which kind of link everybody's together. This is the origin of all eukaryotes, which is right about 2.5 to 2.5 2, 2 to 2.5 billion years ago. Um, and then the fungi, of course, are more recent. You can see where they plug in right here. I think we talked about this before, but if we share our common ancestor. Our closest common ancestor is not the plants, but instead it's the fungi, right? Here's our animal kingdom. Here's our Here we could put a dot there for our nearest common ancestor. All right, but let's jump in here and look at the protists for a minute. So again, about two billion years ago, that's where we started to see these guys show up. There are eukaryotes. Protists, I think I said in the last video, which I didn't mean to say, when I said the word prokaryote, I was thinking in my mind of protists. Protists are the term, this is the term that's kind of antiquated. Prokaryote is not, but a protist is kind of an antiquated term. And it um, basically means it's a eukaryote, we're talking about eukaryotes that are not animals, plants, or fungus. So they're pretty... Um, vast. There's sort of there's sort of a lot. They don't have all the determining features of plants, animals, or fungus, but we'll see there's like plant-like protists, animal-like protists, and fungi-like protists. And I'll kind of show you those as we go. Um, but anyway, so it's kind of broad and doesn't, protists, the term doesn't um, really indicate one single evolutionary grouping, which is how we like to do things, right? We like to group things in in you know by 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 common commonality and we can't really do that with the protists because they're too broad so i guess what really st 
distinguished protists and the rest of the um, eukaryotes is the nucleus, but that's more or less it. Not all protists share a common ancestor, which is confusing. So here, this will, I should have shown this while I was talking. So here's kind of what I'm talking about. Here's this kind of modified cladogram. Here's the origin of all life, right? Um, then we've got the plants here. We've got the fungi over here, and we have the animals right over here, right? So this is the eukaryotic domain. So if you look on the plants, we see mosses, liverworts, hornworts. We're going to talk about these next time. But then you see the photosynthetic protists. That's kind of where the algae plug in. So they're plant-like protists. And then if you pop over here to the fungi, we have fungi-like protists. And then if we look over to the animal arms here, we have animal-like protists. So not all protists share a common ancestor, which is, again, sort of confusing. But they're different from, you know, if the plant-like protists and the animal-like protists and the fungi-like protists are different from one another, right? So it's sort of strange. Um, so we kind of think that protists have some, give, can give us some pretty important clues in terms of the origin of all eukaryotes. So what we started seeing with the protists is the acquisition of more organelles, the transition from being unicellular to multicellular. So an example we use sometimes are um, these things called colanoflagellites, which you can see on the picture there. And colanoflagellites are our most animal-like um, protists, and they, re they start to look a lot like sponges, which is an animal. We'll learn about these guys later on. So these, colan colano these, these um, colanoflagellates you know, closely resemble this particular type of animal, right? So they are giving us some clues. And, and um, let me see if I have this here I have somewhere, I think, coming. But remember in the last, the end of the last lecture, I talked about the theory of endosymbiosis. And there was a scientist that I was having a hard time remembering her name, but her name was Lynn Margulies. And she really fought for this whole concept, which was, which um, didn't go over that well. And basically she kind of defined this process of endosymbiosis which kind of explains the acquisition potentially of organelles. And if you remember, I said that basically her argument was there was like this big prokaryote who ingested like a smaller prokaryote and decided to kind of keep it, right? And let it make some energy for it. And so that smaller prokaryote that was ingested is said to be either mitochondria or chloroplasts. And that, because of course we know that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts are our energy making organelles in either plants or animals, depending on which one we're talking about. So that is sort of the first idea or the first sort of um, inkling in terms of how these organelles actually, you know, came to be inside of these cells. And of course the, the, the presence of the nucleus and the organelles is what the definition of a eukaryotic cell is, so, or a eukaryote. So that's kind of where they all kind of come from. There's a ton of these. They're super, super small. And all of them live someplace wet. Maybe just a little bit wet or maybe purely aquatic, but they need moist environments. Um, there was three major adaptations that arose in protists that we hadn't seen in our um, either bacteria or archaea before. One is the ability to reproduce sexually as opposed to binary fission. The second is the acquisition of the organelles, which I just talked about. And the third is the ability to be multicellular. Not all protists are multi multicellular. There are some unicellular ones, which I'll show you. But um, a vast majority of them are multicellular. So this is an example of um, sexual reproduction in protists. And it's kind of a cycle. And you can see that um, we have our haploid little haploid uh, organisms here, it's haploid um, mating type cells, if you will, pairing together, right? So we've got the, a positive and a negative, or a male and a female. I'm using those terms loosely, of course. 
which are going to join together and they are going to produce a diploid organism, which we know is a zygote. And then that zygote can divide via meiosis and ultimately produce more haploid organisms, right? So it's this kind of like, um, first, it's the first opportunity up, up to this point where we saw this kind of reproduction. So you can find protists in colonies, which is an, this is an example of that here. This is called something called an ananobiana. It's a, an example of a cyanobacteria. Um, and it's form in, formed in colonies. And then we have another cool looking protist here, which is a multicellular protist called a volvox, volvox which is an example of this, a green algae. And these, this particular organism, this multicellular organism, they're individual cells, but they kind of stick together in groups. Um, and each one of the cells has its own job. So that's a new thing, right? So it's individual cells, but they're grouped together. And each, each, each individual cell has a function. And this is the first time that we've seen this happen, right? This is, this is the first um, appearance of this like sort of individual cells working together to perform a common function. All right, so here's our first protist where we saw some, some absolute organelles and it's called the euglenia. Look how cute that thing is, right? And so it's pretty simple. Um, but it's got some organelles in there. It can make its own food, and it can also it also can rely on um, another food source. That's what the autotrophic and heterotrophic words refer to, if you remember. An autotroph is something that can make its own food. So it all depended if there was light around. It has a chloroplast, so it can make energy that way. And if not, it can ingest food and make energy that way. So we've got both a chloroplast and a mitochondria in this little critter. Um, so we usually classify protists, again, by what they gave rise to. So we have our plant-like protists, which we talked about before. Where are they? Oh, they're over here. Those, a good example of those are algae. We have our fungi-like protists. These guys over here, these are water molds and slime molds. I'm gonna show you some of those. Those are super cool. And we have our animal-like protists, a protozoa or a, an amoeba or a paramecium are good examples of those guys. And again, they plug in right here. All right, so let's look at them quickly. Our plant-like protists and algae is an example of one of these. These are photosynthetic protists, which means they use energy from the sun to, or pardon me, they use, they harness sun's energy to produce their own energy. They're super important. There's a lot of them around. And remember, these things are in aquatic or in moist environments or aquatic environments. And it turns out that these algae produce most of the earth's oxygen, especially early on. Um, that's when we could start to transition to life on earth is, uh, you know, animals living on earth or plants and animals living on earth is when we had some oxygen available for them to be able to actually use to make some energy. Um, these plant-like protists, these algae, make up the base of the aquatic food chain, and they give us a whole bunch of stuff. Um, silica, which comes from a diatome, I'll show you a picture in a minute of. Um, auger, carrageenan, algin, all of those are thickening agents in food. Those are types of plant-like protists, algae, essentially. Nori, of course, we all know nori, that holds our sushi together. That's an algae. It's a plant-like protist. So there's all kinds of things that we make out of these. Here's a couple pictures. We talked about the euglenia before, cute thing. Here's some red algae. These diatoms, these are super cute. These are um, things that can, can kind of basically, um, they sort of make glass. So, you know, they're the thing that's in your tooth, the, the gritty stuff in your toothpaste that make, polishes your teeth. Those are diatoms. Here's a super cool picture of green algae. Here's a plant, for, uh, kelp forest, brown algae red algae on the um, surface of the water. We saw a lot of that this year here in Southern California. Um, here is a dinoflagellate, which is a crazy looking critter. So those are all examples of plant-like protists. Then we've got our fungi-like protists. Um, they are not true fungi. They're not photosynthetic. They have what we call filamentous feeding structures. Unlike a true Protists, they don't have the stuff called chitin in the cell walls, which I'll talk about when I talk about this um, fungi later. Um, examples of fungi like protists are things called slime molds. These things are crazy. 
Um, here's a picture of this is a plasmodial slime mold. This is a cellular slime mold. And this is a um, water mold. This is what water mold looks like. That's a potato, actually. Um, these slime molds are so crazy. I gotta stop everything and I want to show you um, this video. Let's see if I can pull it up. Oh yeah, here, of a slime mold. It's not very long. Let's check it out. So this guy spent his whole life looking at slime molds. And those are individual protists, all separate, right? But they can work together. So usually some kind of stressor causes them to pull together. So that's what we're going to see. So they kind of pull together. So these are all individual protists, but they pull together and then they work as a unit. It's so awesome. So see, they're all kind of gathering together. And what they're going to do is they're going to work as a unit. And essentially, we're going to see like the top of them. Or the, they're going to form a fruiting body. And the bottom of them are going to die off. So that top part's going to pull up and it's going to um, form a spore, and that top part's going to drop the spores, and the bottom part's going to die. It's awesome. So you can see, so all this stuff down here, these are going to sacrifice, and the top part's going to be the reproductive part. Freezing. I don't know. That's a slime. They're so, so awesome. Let's get back to what we're doing here. All right. So, sorry about that. Okay. So let's see here. Let's finish up by talking about these animal-like protists. A general term for this is a protozoa. These are the things we've been looking at in the pond water. Most of the animal-like protists are unicellular and they need something to eat other than uh, light energy. They move around by like a tail-like structure called a flagella, or they have little hair-like structures. Um, some of them are free living, but other one of them are commensal, which are parasitic. They have to rely on something else to kind of help them. Most of them um, reproduce asexually, but some do sexually. So this is an amoeba, super cool unicellular protist. This is a ciliated paramecium. These are the things we've been looking for in pond water. These things are tiny, right? They look big, but they're tiny. Look at the scale. And then this is what Giardia is. Giardia is actually a protist. It's a parasite. And it is flagellated, which means it can swim around. 